Hello everyone, this is Jonathan Little, and I'm here today with the 23rd episode of Weekly Poker Hand. And today I have a very fun hand from a $10,000 buy-in pot limit hold'em tournament event that took place at the World Series of Poker this um, last summer. So I'm actually not going to show you my hand as we go through this. I want you guys to try to deduce what you think I have. Um, so I guess I'll talk my way through it as well. So in this hand, we have a loose aggressive kid min raising at 200, 400. He min raises from third position, and I have an effective stack size of, we will call it, 90 big blinds. So loose aggressive kid number one raises to 800. Then another loose aggressive kid in the hijack seat re raises to 2400. I don't remember exactly who these kids were, but for me to label them loose aggressive in a pot limit hold'em event, that means they're probably playing fairly aggressively because you're going to find that in a game where there are no antis, which are the beginning stages of no limit hold'em tournaments, also you'll find pot limit Omaha events, pot limit hold'em events, and also most no limit cash games. Since there are no antis involved in those games, you can actually play somewhat tightly and it's not really that big of a deal because you lose so few chips each orbit. So in those games, being overly loose aggressive is often not a great idea, especially from early position. So anyways, these guys are tagged as lags, and that means that I think they are getting after it a reasonable amount. I don't, I don't think they are tight by any means. So fold round to me in the small blind. Remember, we have a third position raise, hijack, three bet, and I re-raise to 5,600, which is slightly more than a min re-raise. I mean, I guess a min re-raise would be... Um, 1,600 more than 2,400, so to 4,000. So I make it 5,600, which is slightly more than two times the last bets from the small blind. And I've been tight aggressive. I've not been out of line. But at the same time, you know, people can look at me and tell that I'm a younger guy, and they probably know that I'm at least capable. So what type of hands do you think I am going to be doing this with? And it, it's actually a really interesting thing, because if my opponents are all somewhat snug, I'm almost never, ever, ever doing this as a bluff. I have to have an extraordinarily good value hand, like aces, kings, Maybe queens, maybe jacks, maybe ace king. I could consider calling with those as well. But um, yeah, I, I like re raising. I think I, I think I'd probably be re raising most of those. But against aggressive kids, I'm going to be much more inclined to be bluffing some percentage of the time in this spot because I expect them to give me a, at least a decent amount of credit. So I could easily have hands that have blockers like ace 10 or ace jack, and I would be doing those effectively as a bluff. If I get five bets, I would definitely fold. I could also be doing with stuff like king-queen, king-jack, and then also maybe various suited connectors. But I generally prefer to do it with hands that have blockers. I could also do it with stuff like ace-five suited and whatnot, hands that have some potential after the flop that also have an ace in them. Uh, so I, I would be doing that with my value hands and also with a much wider range of bluffs against these type, this type of player. So the first loose aggressive kid folds, second one calls. Flop comes queen-queen-seven, which is... Eh, you know, it, it's okay for my range. I, I don't think it's too particularly good or bad. And on the flop, I bet 5,600, and my opponent decides to call. So I think I'm going to be betting queen, queen, seven with almost my entire range. I am generally happy on this board, I think, compared to my opponent. I think my opponent's going to have a lot of marginal pairs, or maybe like ace-jack, or maybe ace-king, maybe... Um, stuff like 8-7 suited. So I, I think that in general, my range is going to be stronger than my opponent's. I could easily have stuff like a 7 I could have stuff like any queen, any reasonable queen, like queen-9 suited or queen-jack or something like that. Uh, so I, I think that this is going to be better for me than my opponent in general, especially if he thinks that I'm playing tight aggressive. However, given that we are so incredibly deep stacked, my opponent may decide to float in this spot and then try to represent a queen on the turn. So I have to be aware of that, that if I'm sitting here with something like pocket aces, I just cannot fold this hand. So I have to figure out how would I get money in if I had pocket aces. And I think I'm going to need to check the turn a lot of the time to let my opponent bluff, or at least to get one more street of value from him whenever the turn checks through and I bet the river. So turns a 10, which is, you know, again, it's it's fine for my range. I decided to bet 6,700 now into a 23,000 chip pot. So this is a very small bet. And this is kind of screaming strength to me at this point. I, I think that I'm not going to be making this play as a bluff too often unless I have a really good read on my opponent that he does not have a queen. Because even though I said that the queen-queen-seven board is good for my range, 
my my opponent could just have a queen, right? It's not impossible for him to have queen jack suited or king queen or ace queen or queen 10 or something like that. So I have to be somewhat careful on the spot. And you're going to find that quite often whenever you are in these scenarios, both players' ranges are not too incredibly wide, but at the same time, they could have started wide. So we, the range is starting to get narrowed by the time we get to the turn. When I bet again, I, I don't think my opponent is getting the right price to call with very many hands worse than perhaps pocket nines. Remember the board's queen, queen, seven, ten. So if he calls this turn bet, he should have something pretty good. So that being said, I don't really mind betting this turn as a bluff because I think my opponent can call the flop with a lot of stuff, like ace high and smaller pairs. But once I bet again on the turn, I think this should clean up. It should make him fold out a lot of a lot of hands. So if I bet the turn and I bet again on the river, I probably have a very good hand. But if I bet again on this turn and then check the river, I probably don't have a very good hand. So you want to be in spots like that where you can make your opponent put in a huge percentage of their stack in a scenario where they don't really know what's going on with your range. And I think this is a really good example of a spot where on the turn, my range, you guys may think my range is defined, but it's not very cleanly defined. It could be stuff like ace-king, ace-jack. It could be a queen. It could be random 8-7 suited type hands that are effectively bluffs at this point. And it could also just be stone air. And I, I do like just making a bet because I think some type of small bet forces my opponent to have something pretty good to continue. So I do bet 6,700 and he calls. Okay. When my opponent calls a turn, again, I sort of just narrowed that range, but I think he's going to have mostly queens, maybe jacks, maybe, of course, he could have tens, he could have sevens. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe ace king, maybe ace jack if he's deciding to get frisky. He could also have pocket aces or pocket kings. Or. He could be on a completely different level and think that I am just trying to run some stone bluff, and maybe he is going to try to bluff me on the river with all sorts of stuff, like pocket twos or ace-king if he had ace-king or ace-jack if he had ace-jack, but he probably won't bluff on this river with it, with those hands. He could also have nine-eight, maybe, <laughs> if you really wanted to get out of line. So it, it's, it's really difficult to define. I think something that a lot of very good poker players run into whenever they are sort of assessing ranges is that they think that they have to they have to nail down a range and say that this is the guy's range but you don't really know right and you have to do a lot of guessing because in the spot my opponent could just have only very strong hands when he calls my turn bet or he could have a lot of very weak hands but it's really hard to know because again just looking at this replay we don't know who this guy was and we don't know what he looked like in the exact scenario and we also don't know exactly what he thinks about me. So there are a lot of unknowns. So in this scenario, don't don't try to narrow your opponent's range too incredibly much. I mean, if like, if, say he shows up with pocket queens, right? Then, well, I, mean, I guess pocket queens doesn't really say much. But say he, say we bet the river, say we go all in on the river and he calls with pocket nines, that's going to tell us a lot about his range, but we, we don't know that going into this scenario. So a lot of the time you're dealing with these unknown scenarios where, like, I don't really know what my opponent's going to do whenever I cold four bet and he calls the cold four bet, right? It's... It's very difficult to know. So um, if I bet the river, I imagine I have ace-king or better, I would think. I guess I could have a queen also if I decided to bet a queen. I may check a queen on this river if I had ace-queen or king-queen. I don't think my opponent's really going to be betting with too many worse hands if I... Or too many better... Too many worse hands if I check. So I think I need to bet... Or I guess I could check those. I could go either way. If I had aces, I should definitely check to induce a bluff. If I have kings, I should definitely check to induce a bluff. Uh, if I had ace-jack, I should check to induce a bluff. So queen, uh, yeah, I think my opponent's going to have a pretty tough time calling with worse than a queen if I bet. So I guess checking with a queen's fine. And if I had a straight or better, I should probably bet because I think my opponent's definitely going to call with a queen if I bet. So I'm betting with the good hands and checking with the marginal hands. If I had a bluff, I'd probably just give up at this point. So I check the river and my opponent goes all in. And now at this point, um, I, I pretty much just said what I was going to do. I'm not going to be folding ace jack or better in this scenario. I think that my opponent's going to have enough random spaz outs in his range that I pretty much need to call. I guess I could tighten it up a little bit and only call with something like pocket kings or better, maybe folding out ace jack, but I feel like those hands are both pretty similar. I don't think my opponent's going to be betting with kings or aces on this river if he does have those. Maybe he would. It's tough to say. See, this is one of the spots, again, where it's just very muddled. It's, it's very difficult to know what your opponent's going to do. Um, so I do end up calling. So knowing that I call, well, I guess it, it just popped the hand up. Um, I was going to say, I, I, I probably have something pretty good, like aces or kings or better, and I did have king-queen for war, three of a kind. And my opponent somehow had ace-king. So he called the three or called the four bet, 
called on Queen Queen Seven, which I think is kind of insane. Uh, called on the ten turn and then got there on the river to end up busting me. So that was a bit of an unfortunate spot, but I don't really think I did anything wrong in it. A lot of people will look at this hand, I'm sure, and say, oh, you shouldn't have four bet the king queen preflop that you got yourself in trouble. But in reality, you have to recognize that I'm going to be winning this hand a lot of the time when my opponent does not improve. Like, say it just comes nine, eight, six. He's for sure going to fold to a bet, I would think. <laughs> um, and whenever he does get a board that's relatively good for him, I guess I'm going to, I'm going to lose some chips, <laughs> but you have to be okay with that. Whenever you are getting out of line and making these aggressive four bet plays. Um, but in general, I think this is about where I would fold every time preflop, unless I had a really good reason to think my opponents were getting out of line. And in this spot, I got a little bit unlucky that my opponent was not getting out of line. Then I also got unlucky in that I made almost the nuts and got outdrawn. So I'm fine losing in this spot. I don't really have an issue with it. And um, whenever you do look at your hands where you lose a lot of money or when you bust out of a tournament, always try to figure out if you think you played the hand wrong or did anything completely out of line. And quite often, if you, if you just bust in a really absurd way, you're probably doing stuff wrong on a regular basis. I mean, whenever I look at my bust out hands, very rarely am I making some sort of insane play. And... I don't think a lot of very good players are making a lot of insane plays, but you'll see this a lot from particularly maybe five hundred to thousand dollar buy-in regular tournament players. The reason they are not winning at higher stakes games is because they have fancy play syndrome and they are just getting bonkersly out of line in spots like this. Like they would show up with eight seven offsuit in this hand and be bluffing with it for no good reason. So uh, definitely don't get too carried away. Um, speaking of that, I definitely want to suggest that you guys go to jonathanlittlepoker.com/free. And you can get my audiobooks, um, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker Volume 1, and also Positive Poker, which if you have the fancy play syndrome, it will help you get rid of that. Uh, you can get both of those audiobooks for absolutely free just by going to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash free. So thank you guys very much for being here with me today. If you have any questions or comments, definitely let me know and share the podcast with your friends. That's the most helpful thing you could possibly do for me. Thank you very much, and I will talk to you next week.